So next up is Victor Minden from Stanford University, and his field of study is computational and mathematical engineering. His advisor was Lexing Ying, and his practicum was at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Victor? Great. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, so I've got a really long title here, which I'm not going to read again. Uh, but let me just say that we're going to be talking a lot about some numerical linear algebra algorithms I work on today. And this is a joint work with a previous postdoc of my advisors, Ken Ho, Anil Damle, another graduate student in my group, and my advisor, Lexing Ying. So what we're going to be talking about is algorithms for structured matrices. But I figured that before we talk about the algorithms, we should talk about what a structured matrix is. So here's my prologue. Some matrices have structure. And of course, I thought the best way to demonstrate this is to show you a non-example. This is just a random matrix I've generated, and it has no structure, at least not the type of structure that I care about. So what that means for me is that if I am given this matrix, there's not much I can do with it. If I want to solve a system, I'm going to have to do a regular old order n cubed algorithm to solve. If I want to do any sort of square root of the matrix, things like that, there's no tricks I can take advantage of. In contrast, what we have here is something that might look familiar to a lot of you. This is a finite difference matrix. What I've done is I've taken a PDE and I've discretized it on this grid here using a simple finite difference scheme. And then I can kind of spy or view the matrix on the right here. And what you see immediately is that this matrix looks a lot more interesting than the other matrix. In particular, it's sparse. So it has lots of zeros, which corresponds to this big white background. And then where it has its non-zeros are in these kind of set spots along the super and sub diagonals. And this exactly corresponds. So I have 16 different blocks. Let's see if I have a laser pointer. There we go. I have 16 different blocks in my grid here, corresponding exactly to 16 different blocks of my matrix. So this is the first block talking to itself. Next to it, the first block talking to maybe its right neighbor. And over here, its neighbor beneath it, for example. And so this corresponds to some sense of locality in your finite difference stencil here. And what's important about having this sort of structure, as probably many of you know, is that when you have structure, you have fast algorithms. You can do better than order n cubed. So the canonical example for this sort of problem would be the nested dissection or the multifrontal method. It's been around since the 70s. And this lets you solve things really quickly when you have this sort of grid structure uh, on a sparse matrix. So in particular, I mean, normally it would cost you order n cubed. You can get something like order n squared or even order n to the 1.5 using nested dissection in 2D for a problem of this type. Um, of course, n here is the total number of degrees of freedom discretizing the problem. But what I want to talk about is dense matrices that have a similar sort of structure. Uh, so just as a quick review, a low rank matrix is going to be some matrix where you have m degrees of freedom on the rows and on the columns, and you can factor it into something that is in some sense data sparse. So before we had order m n degrees of freedom, you know, each number in this matrix. Now we have something like order m k. So if k is small, if the rank is low of this matrix, you've compressed it. And this is an important building block in looking at the structure for dense matrices. So to build a dense matrix, here's an example that's going to come up in Gaussian processes later. Um, just, just take a whole bunch of scattered data points in two dimensions. And so that's what I have here in this box on the left. Uh, left. <laughs> and we're going to have some kernel function. And that kernel function is going to be something that takes two points and gives you some sort of a correlation, say, between them. Uh, it's going to be something that's nice and relatively smooth. And what we're going to do is use these points and this kernel function to define a matrix. So this is a kernel matrix, aptly named. And what's interesting about this kernel matrix is if I divide these, oops, yes, if I divide these points up into 16 different boxes here and look over here and order them in that way, you kind of see a similar structure start to emerge. Now, of course, this is corresponding to the non-zero pattern here. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say the non-zero pattern. This is corresponding, of course, to seeing big entries on the diagonal and super and sub diagonals and kind of smaller entries off the diagonal. But they're not zero. So this is not a sparse matrix. This is a dense matrix. And so it wouldn't be immediately evident what you can do to do fast linear algebra with this matrix. There's more than just this kind of relative size of the entries, though. There's actually a rank structure going on here. And this is well known. What we have here is that I've divided things up into 16 blocks again. And just where we had like non-zero entries in the sparse case, we now have full rank matrices in this dense case. These are things that you cannot compress. These are interactions between points in a box and their neighboring points via this kernel function. On the other hand, all of these light gray blocks are low rank and compressible. And that's sort of the same idea as what we had in the sparse case. In the sparse case, you just had zero. Now you have something that can be represented with a small amount of data, a small number of data. So 
So you might be asking, wait, what does this have to do with Gaussian processes, or even what is a Gaussian process? So let's back up for a second, because that wasn't my title. So Gaussian process is just some stochastic function, some stochastic field that we'll say in, right now is a function of 2D space and maps you to some real valued function. So over here, here are two different realizations of a Gaussian process. Uh, the key point for Gaussianity is that all of your finite dimensional distributions are multivariate normal. All that means is that if you sample a bunch of different points in space and look at the value, I'm sorry, and look at the values of like the value over here correlating with the value over here and so on, all of those finite number of points, their distribution is multivariate normal. And this gives you a lot of things you can do with Gaussian processes. What's really important is that because it's normal, the entire probability structure of this random field is given by this kernel function sigma ij, which just tells you the correlation between any two points, given some parameters theta. So you may have seen this before. These are known as Krieging in uh, geostatistics, where they were using it for mining, I believe, originally. Now it's used a lot in environmental sciences as well. Uh, and of course, real functions are usually not random. So it's hard to imagine why you might use this sort of a model. But it actually ends up being a really good thing when you have scattered data observations and you want to do some sort of interpolation or learning off of your data. Uh, so even though the real data is not random, you can think of this as taking some sort of a Bayesian prior over your functions if you're a statistician, or you can just think about it as plain old radial basis function interpolation if you're just a numerical analyst. I shouldn't say just. <laughs> um, let's see. I, you can do prediction with this. There's some simple formulas to say what you think the field should be at some, uh, some locations where you don't know the data given what you know about the field at these observed locations O. And these are going to involve some sort of linear algebra with this kernel matrix sigma, right? This is our covariance matrix. Its entries are given by our covariance kernel. What's really important about Gaussian processes is parametrizing the covariance and your choice of covariance kernel. And the reason for this is that different covariance, this is the only thing that defines this unique Gaussian process is this kernel. So even if I just were to say, okay, my kernel looks something like this, I can still choose things like characteristic length scales in each direction. So maybe it's really correlated along the uh, y direction and not so much in the x direction. Or maybe it's more isotropic. And these give you really different looking fields. And so your interpolations start to look different in these sorts of things. So figuring out what these parameters are can be interesting both for interpolating correctly and for learning something about the data set that you've sampled. Maybe it's something like transmissibility in the ground. Maybe it's something like a temperature field. So we're going to apply these, H mat or these um, matrices that I have yet to name <laughs> to uh, the task of maximum likelihood estimation of these parameters, theta. So what we do is we take our data, and that's our input, and we take some family of functions that are going to be our, our guess at a kernel function, but we're going to parameterize it up to some theta parameter. So we're going to say, okay, you know most of what this covariance kernel looks like, but let's learn the individual data, or the, learn the individual parameters for this specific realization from our data that we've observed. So this is just maximum likelihood estimation. And we're going to do it using black box gradient-based first order optimization. So what that means is that every step of some optimization routine, we're going to tell it how we compute the uh, log likelihood here and how we compute the components of the gradient. And it's going to walk around and do a quasi-Newton method or something like that to optimize and find the best theta for this particular data set. Now, what we note is that, or I should say, OK, this is typically order n cubed using a naive approach, but other people have ideas how to do this, and they're good ideas. A lot of them look similar to these sorts of ideas. <laughs> to do this sort of gradient evaluation and this log likelihood evaluation, we know that there's a lot of linear algebra that you need to do with the matrix sigma, this covariance matrix, this kernel matrix, something we've already said should have some nice structure to it. We need to be able to solve systems with it. We need to be able to compute its log determinant, assuming we want to actually evaluate the objective function. If you want to play with the gradient, you're going to need to be able to apply it quickly, I'm sorry, apply its derivative quickly, solve systems with it, and do this funny trace of a product of two funny looking matrices here, which is actually the, kind of the hard part of all of this. And I'm not going to talk about that term in detail, but that is the hard part. <laughs> so as I said, our approach is going to be to use some of these structured matrix techniques, um, particularly these rank structured matrix algorithms. I'm going to talk a little bit about one that we've been working on in my group. Uh, of course, there are other people that are interested in using these H matrix or these hierarchical type rank structured matrix techniques for this sort of a problem, some of them in this room. Uh, here are my citations. <laughs> so when it comes to these rank structure matrices, you might be thinking, hang on, I've seen all this before. <laughs> so I would say, you know, factorization, when it comes to rank structure, there are many like this factorization, but this one is ours. <laughs> so, 
And I mean, so one really big area of this is the H matrix algebra coming out of Germany. So this is Hackbush and Bevendorf and their collaborators. And that's sort of the general framework for this. Most recently, some of you may have heard about the inverse fast multipole method, which is going to look a lot like what I present here. They're kind of two sides of the same coin in that respect. So just doing my homework. What I want to show you now is what an algorithm looks like. And to me, that's really a visual process. There's not going to be a whole lot of math here. So as we said before, if we have some domain, we can subdivide it up into little boxes. And we know that boxes talking to their nearby neighbors, so we have points inside this box and points inside the blue region. In those points, the kernel evaluations between them will have a full rank interaction, or at least we're going to assume that. On the other hand, the brown box talking to all these red boxes, that's going to be far enough away that we're going to consider that compressible. And so that corresponds exactly to this block matrix here and that partitioning. And the circled matrices are going to be long, skinny, or tall, skinny things that are compressible. And that's important. As far as what this algorithm actually looks like, let's go ahead and just pick up one of these boxes on our domain. So this, keep in mind, this is the domain. This is not a matrix. And um, we're going to select one of these boxes and look at what its near neighbors are and what its far neighbors are, or far field is. And we're just going to compress the interaction. The way we're going to do that is we're going to subselect some of these points in a smart way. And those points are going to be the representative points for this box. Now, this is called an interpolative decomposition. It's really, there's some linear algebra behind this that's nice and cool, and that's what's important in doing this fast. But visually, all you need to know is that this box can be essentially represented by this subset of points. Of course, it's probably evident what the next thing is. I'm going to step onto the next box. I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to do this for every box. And what's kind of cool is that even though we were doing this with a dense matrix, what we get out at the end of the day is something that sort of, if you squint, looks a lot like what would happen if you did a nested dissection algorithm here. You have degrees of freedom, these skeletons, we call them, these representatives of each box that sort of line the boundaries of the boxes. And the interiors of these boxes have mostly been eliminated and decoupled in some way doing this compression. Of course, the kicker, what I haven't told you yet, is that at this point, you might think we're done. But of course, I called these hierarchical matrices at one point. I let slip my secret. The kicker here is that we can do this again, right? I never said that these boxes had to be this size. So I'm just going to aggregate four of them together and do the exact same process, where I take a box, I eliminate some of its degrees of freedom, and I do this all the way down to the bottom. At this point now, I'd be done. But in reality, you're going to have something like a logarithmic number of levels and the total number of degrees of freedom. And that's the idea behind these sort of fast algorithms for these sorts of problems. Now, I don't really want to talk about the complexity in great detail. I'm just going to say that under certain assumptions, you get linear complexity solves out of this sort of thing. And furthermore, you can compute most of the things that you need for this log likelihood evaluation and this gradient evaluation. That is to say, you can solve systems with kernel matrices. You can compute the log determinant. You can apply or solve with a square root, which might be interested in for sampling from this Gaussian process. Uh, you don't get the trace of product. And like I said, I can't. it takes a little bit more. You can ask me about it in the questions if you're interested. So here's just a quick example. So this, again, is a Gaussian process realization uh, there. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to sample that data on a grid, so a much uh, coarser grid than the one that you see there, I guess. And I'm going to look at the runtime for doing one objective function evaluation and one gradient evaluation, which would correspond more or less to one step of quasi-Newton. So maybe you have to do this seven or 10 times to do your maximum likelihood estimation. And what we have over here on the right is for two different compression tolerances. So when I compress, I have to choose how accurate I want this to be, right? And as long as I'm accurate enough to match my data, this is a good idea to do. And for two different compression tolerances, I see roughly the same scaling behavior, which is pretty close to this bottom line, n to the 1.5, which is a lot better than n cubed, and uh, seemingly less in this top line, n squared, although, of course, it's hard to see asymptotics in a finite number of observations. I should say, you might be confused. I said that this should be a linear time algorithm, but really what you're seeing here is n to the 1.5. That has to do with the scaling of this trace of the product term that I mentioned. So I wish I had another plot of this, but I uh, just thought about that just now. <laughs> um, I also have some example on real data, although I don't want to call this real science. This is still a toy example, but it looks pretty cool. Uh, so you can probably see on the right picture, this, so this data come from uh, ICOADS, and I can't really read what this stands for, but it's a very nice data set of sea surface temperatures. And 
what I've done is I've put some artificial occlusion on the left in these scattered observations of the sea surface temperature in the Atlantic through the month of July across a couple years. And I said, okay, let's learn a kernel on this that we can use to do some interpolation and we can do to learn some parameters. And we did exactly that and you get a nice pretty picture. But it's fun to look at. I wouldn't take too much from this, but it's nice to look at. Uh, so some final thoughts. What I want to say is that in practice, matrices are easy. So I mentioned before that if I didn't know anything about my matrix, I might expect that I need to do order n cubed work to do basically anything I might care about with it. But when you know something about your matrix, when you have some sort of structure, you should take advantage of it, and especially, uh, and especially if you have this rank structure. Now there's some other applications and extensions of this work that I've done in the past or will be doing in the future. Uh, we talked about Gaussian processes today. That's not my main line of research. Uh, really, where these kind of come out of is preconditioners and direct solvers for things like low frequency scattering or for potential problems. Uh, I've done some work on updating these sorts of factorizations. So what if your points kind of change around? Is there a way that you can take a factorization for your old problem and then take into account some new observations or some new data points and save the work from that old factorization? Um, and finally, in the interest of HPC, I should, I'll have to clarify, everything I showed you here so far was in MATLAB. Uh, a little bit of C++, no parallel. But we're working, we have a, a parallel C++ implementation of a related algorithm, and we're working to get it done for the dense case as well. So that's some future work. Um, acknowledgements, yeah. So <laughs> I guess we're at the end here. I wanted to say thanks a lot to the Department of Energy and the Computational Science Graduate Fellowship Group. Uh, my research would not have been possible without you guys. And also to the Corel Institute, because uh, you know, it's a lot of work administering this program, and we appreciate it. Also, the great community of people here. So, thanks for listening.